Okay, so welcome everybody to workshop number six in the My Life, My Body online workshop series. I am Sophia Forten from the Yukon Association for Community Living, and I'm the sexual health facilitator for the My Life, My Body program. This program is a sexual health and healthy relationship uh, program for the disability community. And we work on advocacy, education, and frontline service to kind of support folks to understand the big umbrella of sexuality um, and really improve this area um, of our clients, our family members' lives. Everyone is a born a sexual being in some form or fashion, and our sexual health, our sexual well-being is really tied to our personal identity and our sense of wellness and safety in the world. And everyone deserves to kind of be able to have that um, explored in its fullest capacity, whatever works and is right for them. So that's kind of a little bit behind the program. Uh, we run online workshops, we do trainings, we do one-on-one uh, -on -one client work, we offer a range of programs, and you can find all of the information at hsucon.com. Today we are talking about sexuality and identity how to talk about it, uh, how to navigate it. Um, mainly my goal with this workshop today is to just give folks kind of uh, what I call the ABCs or the alphabet <laughs> of sexual identity. Uh, and then we'll chat a little bit about um, some of the challenges that folks um, within sexual minorities face and how to be an ally and support for our clients and family members. Finally, we'll talk about some resources. They will be a little bit Yukon specific, but I do have some learning resources that are uh, just on the World Wide Web for anybody. And we'll take questions. If you are with us live today and on the chat, you can chat anytime with your questions. If you would like to uh, ask a question anonymously, you can send me an email at Sophia, S-O-F-I-A, at ycommunityliving.com. So the chat isn't anonymous, but you can certainly ask me questions there and I will answer them as we go, or you can wait for the Q&A period at the end. Without further ado, we'll kind of dive right in. So the kind of founding belief behind a lot of the work we do here at My Life, My Body is that everyone has the right to safety in their own body and the right to make informed choices about what happens to that body. So when it comes to sexuality, we're talking about folks having an understanding of um, their genitals, of all of their anatomy, having an understanding of how their bodies work when it comes to reproduction and making babies, um, and having an understanding of pleasure in the body, whether it be sexual or non-sexual pleasure, as well as a deep understanding of how to form relationships, whether they be intimate relationships, friendships, uh, relationships with colleagues, or otherwise. And everybody, regardless of their intellectual capacity, their physical ability, or their age, has the right to this safety and this ability to make informed choices. And that's really kind of the perspective or the place that we're coming from in this. Um, for many folks, uh, they may have kind of heard LGBTQ2 as a term. And this is kind of what we're going to be breaking down today. So LGBTQ2 sort of is an umbrella term referring to uh, the panoply of sexual identities that are out there. Uh, it's not an exhaustive term, but it's used as an umbrella term to refer to anyone who basically refers, um, sorry, identifies not uh, in the mainstream. And we'll be talking a little bit more about what that means today, what that looks like, and in particular some of the language that's been flying around that you may or may not be familiar with. So why is sexual identity important? Well, it's made up of many different things. And actually, if you go up to our first workshop where we talk about the model of human sexuality, uh, we talk about how identity or sexual, I, pardon me, identity is a huge part of our sexuality. And really, it has to do with the fact that how we show up in the world, how we are treated in the world, the expectations that people have of us in many different situations, whether they be work or personal relationships, and the expectations that we have of ourselves are very largely linked to our sexuality in the sense that they are very largely linked to 
the genitals that we have between our legs. Um, so this is a huge part of people forming a sense of who they are in the world and feeling safe in that sense of who they are in the world. So if I'm a woman and I identify as being a woman and I like following sort of the tropes and quote unquote rules of being a woman, I'm comfortable in skirts and earrings and long hair, um, I may feel fairly safe in the world, but as we know with all of the Me Too movement and um, you know the stats around sexualized assault and things like that, we know that many women don't feel safe in the world. Many women who are even comfortable in their womanhood do not feel safe in the world or feel safe in their bodies. And that hasn't even scratched the surface of women who may not necessarily feel safe or comfortable uh, as a woman even. So sexuality and identity is a really huge part of who we are. And it's a really huge part of our mental health and our mental wellness. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So a sexual identity is kind of split up into a few different categories. And I'm hoping that by talking through these different categories, people can start to kind of unpack a bunch of these different terms that they may be hearing, because it can be a little bit confusing sometimes. So there are several ways that our sexuality impacts our identity. And the first is gender. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that, but gender really is those social norms that guide how we behave within what we call the gender binary. So the two genders that we assume that all humans um, can be, male or female. So as a society in different cultures across the world, we have different rules and ideas for what it means to take on a male identity and what it means to take on a female identity. And that all has to do with gender. Sexual orientation is another piece of someone's sexual identity, and that has to do with who they are sexually and emotionally attracted to, who they'd like to get in bed with <laughs> and experiment with. Relationship styles is also another part of our sexual identity. So whether we choose to be in a monogamous relationship, in a marriage or common law, uh, or whether we choose to have multiple sexual partners or relationship partners can all be a big part of how we shape an understanding of who we are and who we want to be in the world. And the last piece is around sexual interests. And so that has to do with fantasies, kinks, um, different things that might turn us on or pique us inter our interest within sexuality. And those things can also have um, really big communities and folks who kind of connect around an identity um, of some sort, depending on what it is. So these four things are all really separate um, and defined very differently. They all have their own language, which is what we're going to kind of be talking about next. Uh, but I want to start with a little bit of help from our friend, the gender unicorn. So the Gender Unicorn is lovingly put together by the Trans Student Educational Resources Center in the States. Uh, the URL is there, transstudent.org backslash gender. It's a really handy tool for exploring some of the nuance or the differences between gender, sexual orientation, relationship style, all of these fun things that are interlinked. So we're going to use the Gender in, uh, Unicorn's help to understand these things a little bit more deeply. And just a reminder, if you've got questions, pop them in the chat at any time or send me an email, sophia at whycommunityliving.com. So we're going to start in the middle of the chart here uh, where it says sex assigned at birth. And this is the kind, kind of the foundation of how humans have been sort of taught to think about gender, sexual orientation, and sexuality in general. So we're very much focused on the reproductive organs and the genitals that we have. So sex assigned at birth, or sex, is a term used basically to describe what kind of genitals you have. So you are uh, have a female sex, you're a female. If you have a vulva and a vagina, you're assigned male at birth. That means the doctor looked at your body and saw a penis when he came out. Um, and that would mean male. And then we have other or intersex. And this is new language that's replaced old language that's uh, very offensive. We don't use it anymore, but the term that used to be used was called hermaphrodite. And intersex folks basically have um, ambiguous genitals. So we can't 
assign them or we, we don't necessarily know whether they fit within the female and male categories, so they get assigned an other or intersex category. And this is actually a category that you have, can have assigned on your birth certificate. And the thing I really want to impress here is that we've kind of been fed this idea that humans only come in two kind of makes or models, and that's female or male. Uh, when we go back to grade 10 science, <laughs> we often learn about, you know, the XX and the XY chromosomes. One's male, one's female. They determine the genitals you have and uh, a lot of the other things on this chart. And what we're starting to learn is that in nature, within animals, within humans, within basically all living things that have chromosomes, there can be actually um, many, many, many variations of these kinds of things. You can have an XYX chromosome, you can have an XXYY chromosome, you can have an X with a little thingy on it. There's so many different variations, and those variations are codes to the body that provide instructions for hormonal balance, they provide instructions for what happens to the genitals. Essentially, all babies start in the, um, as an embryo in the uterus um, as girls, or they start with all the same ingredients. So two gonads, which may become testicles or may become ovaries, some skin, and a little bit of uh, testosterone and estrogen. And so the code, the genetic code that we have, determines how all those bits and bobs get organized. And so for some folks, they might end up with a vulva or... Um, you know, externally, um, traditionally female body parts, but they may internally have more um, masculine biology or what we would call male biology. Uh, and they may also have a different hormone balance in their body, even though their um, uh, genitals, their anatomy uh, doesn't kind of match that. So um, there's a lot of different variations, and we need to start to think a little bit past this gender binary, this sex binary even that we've set up, and this idea that humans only come as females or males. In truth, we actually all come as our own individual selves, our own individual cocktail of hormones and mental wiring and brain matter and genitals and all of that is what comes together to form a human and how they want to be um, seen in the world, how they'd like to express themselves in the world, and who they're sexually and emotionally attracted to. <coughs> Pardon me. So it all starts with the sex assigned at birth. Again, let me know if you've got any questions that are coming up for you. You can just pop them in the chat and I'll happily answer them for you. And you'll see that this is a big topic and even I as a sex educator am still working to really master my language around this, um, to step out of the gender binary. So it is something that takes a little bit of time and shifting perspective, but ultimately it's about respecting our fellow human beings, which is why it's well worth the effort. So the second piece that I wanna talk about is gender identity and gender expression. And a perfect example there is to think about an experiment, it was actually circulating through YouTube and I've shared it in the resources, um, about how we teach our little boys and our little girls <laughs> to show up in the world. And gender essentially refers to kind of the norms, the social and cultural norms that we teach um, often, you know, not even deliberately, <laughs> about what it means to be female, a woman, or a girl, or to be feminine, and what it means to be male, a man, or a boy, or masculine. And so the experiment that they did in this YouTube video was they took two babies, so they took um, a baby that was assigned male at birth, and they dressed him in um, a dress, in little girl's clothes, quote-unquote, and they took a young another baby who was assigned female at birth and they dressed her in quote unquote boys clothes. And they set the babies up on a mat with a whole wide range of toys. Some that we would traditionally consider masculine toys like cars and trucks and building blocks and some that we would consider more feminine toys, so dolls and soft plushy things. 
And what they had uh, done was they had some volunteers come and play on the mat with the children. And they just observed which toys the volunteers offered to each of the babies. And it was very clear cut that the volunteers offered the gendered toys to each of the babies. So when people thought they were playing with a little boy, they offered the little boy the trucks, they offered him Lego, they offered him, um, you know, building blocks and those kinds of things. And when they were playing with the little girl, they gave her the baby and they gave her the doll and they gave her the soft plushy toys. So this is just one small example of how gender gets kind of sewn into us from a very young age, whether it has to do with the types of activities that we can do, uh, to how we dress, what we wear, uh, essentially how we express ourselves in the world. That is what gender is all about. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some terms that relate to gender in just a moment. And then the last piece is around sexual orientation. So who we're sexually attracted to, who we're emotionally attracted to. And the difference there is just that, um, you know, sometimes we are sexually attracted to, uh, meaning we want to have sex with multiple different folks. Uh, and there may be a difference there between who we want to have sex with and who we'd like to be in a relationship with. Uh, and that would be the emotionally attracted to. So I may be a person who is emotionally attracted to men, which means I'd like to be in a um, relationship with a man, but I may be sexually attracted to women and men. Um, and so within that relationship, I may um, have sexual encounters with both genders, as an example. So as you can see, there's a lot of different pieces here, a lot of different building blocks that all make up a person's identity, a person's sense of how, who they are, how they want to be in the world, who they connect with, who they want to be like, who they feel safe around, and whether or not they feel safe and seen and recognized in the choices that they make in all of these categories. And that's where we're going to go next. So there's two quick notes I want to make before we dive in a little bit further. One is that the language used to describe sexual identities is constantly in flux and shifting. I mean, essentially, we have a wide range of humans who are living through all of these different experiences and identities, and no two experiences are alike, which means that some folks might, might find commonality in the language, and some people may find that the language still doesn't quite fit them. So it's important to recognize that this language is constantly shifting, and to recognize that really the power is in the person um, who is seeking to find language to describe their experience. Whatever language they are using, whatever labels they are using, um, it are, are for them essentially in their comfort, and we want to kind of respect and, and go along with those. The second piece I want to add is that I personally identify as a cis female, which we'll talk about what that means. I am not a member of the LGBTQ2 community. I am an ally, meaning I am a supporter an advocate. Um, so I'm doing my best here to be respectful of the issues. I can't speak to the lived experiences of folks who uh, live within these communities. I can share the knowledge that has been passed on via various forms of education and advocacy. But I do really encourage people to go online, especially to YouTube. Uh, you can find a lot of different resources from folks who are living these identities on how to best support them, make them feel safe, make them feel seen, um, and make them feel loved. So those are two notes that I just wanted to make. All right, maybe just give me a little note in the chat. Let me know you can still hear me okay, that the quality is doing well, and we will move forward. So alphabet soup. Uh, the caveat I want to say here is I'm going to throw a lot of terms at you. Thank you. Um, you don't need to remember them all. They're all easily searchable online. Uh, but the big kind of takeaway here really is that uh, there's a lot of different words to describe different experiences. And words and labels can be problematic, right? They can be helpful in the sense that they provide categories for us to sort of understand different categories of experiences. But they can be hurtful in the sense that people can be discriminated against because of their identification with one of these labels. Um, 
and they box people in, right? They create a container where we want people to fit into the lesbian box or the trans box. And really that can be very uh, disrespectful and not reflective of the variety of experiences that all trans people may experience or all lesbian people may experience. So we want to remember there's a wide variety of lived experience within all of these terms. And again, like I just said, these terms are really about empowering the folks who are within these communities to find identity and power and connection within them. They're not for us to kind of box people in, but they do help us to kind of navigate some of these experiences. So within gender, we talk about male, female, and intersex. So that's those are actually sex terms, right, when we're talking about sex assigned at birth. Uh, but being male, being female, um, having an intersex identity is also part of that. If someone is cisgender, cis means same, it means that there is a connection, a correlation between the sex they were assigned at birth and the gender that they feel most comfortable in in society. So I am a cis female, which means I have female genitals. I was born with a vagina and a vulva, and I identify with being a woman. I feel comfortable being a woman in the world. I have a sense, my own sense of what it means to be a woman in the world that I connect with and identify with. And there's a sameness or a congruence there for me. Now, that still means that I may, um, I may, uh, that doesn't mean I don't have challenges with what it means to be a woman or how women are treated in society. Uh, but it does mean that for me personally, I'm comfortable being called she. I'm comfortable calling myself a woman. Um, I gravitate to that naturally and, and feel comfortable with it. <clears throat> for folks who are trans, who identify as trans, trans means different. So what that means is that a person who is, uh, well, essentially their gender, how they want to show up in the world does not match the genitals that um, they have or the sex that they were assigned at birth. So if I am a woman or a, sorry, if I am a person who's born with a vagina or a vulva and I'm assigned female at birth, but I identify more with being a man, I would like to show up in the world as a man, I would like to express myself as a man, then I would be a trans man. The opposite is true if I'm a person born with a penis, uh, so sex assigned at birth is male, but I want to show up in the world as a woman, I feel more comfortable being a woman, being called a woman, expressing myself as a woman, then I would be a trans woman. And um, since I'm not a trans person, I can't say much here except to say that every different person's experience is, every person's experience is different in this. People experience different levels of, you know, unconcordance or like feeling different from the sex they were assigned at birth. And they take different actions and different steps to bring themselves into congruence, bring themselves into a place where they feel more comfortable and more themselves. So some people do consider what we call surgery, various forms of surgery. They may do surgery on their genitals. They may do surgery on their breasts. Um, they may do no surgery, they may do some surgeries, so there's all kinds of variations there. When a person undergoes some surgery, we either have MTF, or male to female surgery, or FTM, female to male surgery. Now within gender, the other thing that we're hearing here is that even if we have a person who's identifying as trans, so there's not a connection for them between their genitals and how they want to be in the world, we're still kind of using this gender binary of male and female. So if I don't want to be a woman, but I'd like to be a man, or I don't want to be a woman and I'd like to be, or if I don't want to be a man, sorry, and I'd like to be a woman. But there are some folks who really identify as gender non-conforming or what we call non-binary. And that means people who kind of want to do away with this binary concept of gender, period, and just be like, I am a person, <laughs> I don't identify as a he or a she. I don't want to be a man or a woman. I just want to be a human. So gender non-conforming or non-binary folks, someone who says they identify as non-binary means they really want to identify as just being a human. 
uh, without any of the gendered lens. Gender queer uh, would be someone who is uh, exploring or again feeling kind of in this gender non-conforming space where they don't really want to commit to or subscribe to the gender binary. And two-spirit is another term that you may have heard, um, and it specifically relates to uh, Aboriginal Indigenous First Nations communities. And it um, basically there are uh, there's a kind of a cultural recognition, or there has been a cultural recognition of two-spirit individuals in their communities, and that means folks who kind of have both spirits, right? <laughs> um, and uh, again, without going into air, you know too much detail that I don't know. Um, you know, there really was a lineage there of understanding these folks as having special gifts, special talents, special ways of seeing the world, special ways of being able to move between the masculine and the feminine, um, the male and the female worlds, and they were often thought of as um, medicine people or healers in their communities. So two-spirit is specifically a term uh, referring to trans folks within the Aboriginal Indigenous First Nation community. All right, so those are our gender terms. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just kind of scratching the surface. But if you're hearing these words, this is what they mean. So it all has to do with essentially how we show up in the world, which uh, is really a big part of a person's identity. <clears throat> all right. Sexual orientation terms. So sexual orientation having to do with the... Um, people that we are sexually attracted to, that we would like to have sex with or play with. Um, and again, what you'll notice here is they're very based in the gender binary. They're very based in someone with some kind of genital wanting to have sex with a person of different kind of, of uh, another person who has different genitals or the same genitals. And the words that we use to describe sexual orientation are all about who is having sex with which genitals, which genitals are having sex with which genitals. <laughs> So that's what this is really all about. So heterosexual, which is our norm. That's why I've got the notes on the bottom there. Heteronormative. Pardon the typo there. Excuse me. <sighs> heteronormative means that um, society is predominantly recognized. The majority of folks um, identify with being heterosexual, at least according to what we know about people, what they say. And um, we view the world through a lens of heteronormativity because that's what we've really created and uh, trained ourselves for. So those are the glasses that we view the world through. So hetero, meaning different, means that the genitals that are having sex with each other are different. Um, so typically that would mean that we have female genitals and male genitals in the mix, or a man and a woman in the mix. Homosexual means same, so that means that the same genitals are at play. We may have two men who are in a relationship or in a sexual relationship together. We may have two women who are in a relationship or sexual relationship together. And the other words that we use there are gay and lesbian. Bisexual refers to individuals who are comfortable with or sexually attracted to both genders. So I may, I may want to have sex with men and women. And pansexual is kind of a, um, a term that in particular I'm told youth are really starting to use and identify with. And it's kind of a next generation of recognition, which is just if I identify as pansexual, I am interested in having sex with other humans regardless of their gender identity and regardless of the genitals that they have. So I am interested in the person. I'm sexually attracted to the person. I'm sexually attracted to um, or emotionally attracted to the person. And I don't really care whether they identify as trans, whether they're gay, whether they're lesbian, whether they're bisexual, whatever their sexual identity. I'm just interested in the human behind that. Uh, the last two, asexual. So asexuality refers to folks who basically don't feel that sexual attraction hunger. And that's not to say that they don't have sex, and it's not to say that they don't have relationships. Again, the lived experience there is very different. But the overall kind of description of asexuality is folks who just don't necessarily experience, they don't feel sexual attraction to other people. 
And questioning folks, uh, questioning just means someone who's kind of curious, exploring, not sure uh, which label they fall into or which category they fall into. Uh, they may be essentially exploring, but questioning is kind of a, a big term that we often use and that you'll regularly hear around sexual orientation terms. So again, just check in with me in the chat if you have any questions. Um, may not necessarily be about vocabulary. If there's other stuff that you want to ask about, definitely let me know. Otherwise, I'll keep rolling through. The last two pieces, and I won't spend too much time here, is that folks can really connect with a sense of identity, a sense of self around their relationship style and their sexual interests. And there's lots of different vocabulary here, but around relationship styles, what that basically means is someone's in a monogamous relationship, meaning two people who are in a quote-unquote what we call closed relationship. They're in a relationship together. No one else is in that relationship. And if it's a sexually monogamous relationship, it means they're having sex together and not having sex with other people, generally speaking. A polyamorous relationship is an open relationship. And so that can take various different structures. Um, it could mean more, you know, folks that are comfortable with more kind of casual sex and casual encounters, not necessarily looking for long-term commitments, but it could also mean folks who are interested in longer-term commitments with more than one person at the same time. And this can look like triads, this can look like any number of people entering into a committed relationship with their own agreements um, all together. And it's not to be confused with pansexuality. Uh, so pansexuality means I'm interested in having sex with uh, humans, regardless of how they identify. And polyamory means that I'm not necessarily interested in being with one person for the rest of my life or only having sex with one person for the rest of my life. I'm more interested in having open sexual and romantic relationships. And the last piece here around sexual interest, there's the whole alphabet soup of vocabulary we could go into here. I just listed a few the main point I want to make here is that um, people's sexual interests, fetishes, fantasies can be a big part of their identity. Certainly if there's a discomfort with the um, curiosities that they have and if they haven't connected with other communities of folks, um, then that can really impact somebody. And as well, there are huge communities um, around particular fetishes and interests and people can really find a sense of community and identity within them. So, you know, folks can be referred to as kinky. They might be into fetishes. Vanilla is typically a term referring to folks who uh, are not interested in kinky or kind of quote-unquote out-of-the-box sex. BDSM is another term that we often hear, and that's broken down into bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism. And again, there are varying levels of uh, types of play and experimentation there. It's a very huge world, uh, but it is a part of someone's sexual identity, uh, whether they have the, these interests um, or not. So if we get back to LGBTQ2, uh, that's in and of itself another term that we often hear often. Um, it's essentially, uh, like I said at the beginning, an umbrella term, and it refers to sort of gender and sexual orientation identity communities as a whole. Really, in its essence, and, you know, there can be some discomfort around this, it describes all of the other <laughs> identities, all of these sexual minorities. So people who do not subscribe to or fit into or feel comfortable with um, a hetero, monogamous, non-kinky, um and uh, cisgendered um, perspective of the world. Uh, so when we hear the term LGBTQ2, it's kind of like a, an umbrella term referring to many of the different identities that we talked about earlier and a lot of the different vocabulary that we talked about. All right, that was a big go. <laughs> so... Part of what we want to take away from here is that we're talking about people who are in the minority, right? They're not fitting into the quote-unquote norm, the way society has trained us to kind of think about relationships, to think about sexual orientation, and to think about gender. And what that means is that 
people can internalize a lot of taboo and discomfort and shame around their curiosities and their natural sort of interests. Uh, so they can really be harmed from a mental health perspective from just the internal discomfort that can come from not feeling reconciled with that sense of identity. Uh, the way I like to think about it within the um, intellectual disability community is that, you know, for optimal health and, and kind of wellness, like a person really needs to come to a place of acceptance of whatever their uh, disability or circumstance is. Um, and to really allow that, not to overshadow their identity completely, but to be a piece of their identity. And to really be at peace with that in order to kind of shine their brightest light on, onto the world. And so our sexual identity is really the same. And if we haven't reconciled pieces of um, our experience, we can really struggle, right, with our uh, internally. But then not only that, um, once we may become at peace kind of internally within ourselves with our identity, we can, once we try to start to live that identity out in the world, experience discrimination, violence, sexualized assault, you know, poverty, mental health rates, all that kind of stuff can be a really big challenge um, because of mainly the discrimination and violence that folks within these minority communities can experience. And also just not feeling understood in a broader world that really operates differently than a person may operate. And folks in the intellectual disability community are really well familiar with this. <laughs> um, and one of the challenging parts of sexual identity for folks with intellectual disabilities is that often there's so much going on just to kind of cope with life, maybe the physical challenges um, of a disability or, you know, um, getting a job, like all of these kind of basic needs, that there can often uh, not be a lot of time to think about the question of sexual identity. Um, so I have a story I can share from a friend of mine who's got cerebral palsy, and uh, he talks about how his parents were just so busy with all the medical stuff and so busy just getting him to graduate in his youth that there was just never really a lot of space to have this conversation. And it wasn't until his mid-20s that he even allowed himself to kind of think about or have that conversation with himself um, and realize that he was gay and realize that he wanted to pursue some relationships with other men. So um, it can be kind of at the bottom of the list <laughs> in terms of the things that we're managing because uh, there is a lot to manage sometimes. But it is an important thing, and if it's coming to the surface and we're getting questions about it or people are wondering about it, then it's really important to start to kind of um, talk about it and normalize it. The other numbers I just kind of wanted to share is, you know, we see folks who identify as LGBTQ are, you know, three to four times as likely to attempt suicide. They've got much higher rates of mental health challenges all across the board. And in particular, a very surprising stat is that youth who identify as LGBTQ are about five times more likely to either get pregnant or get someone else pregnant than straight youth. And this has a lot to do with the shame and taboo that they experience where they're kind of having heterosexual sex either as a way to experiment or come to terms with what's going on for them or because they're feeling, you know, repressed and shamed. And as a result, they're having sort of riskier sex <laughs> and they're taking less precautions. Uh, which is resulting in more pregnancy. So these are just kind of some examples of the challenges that folks within our LGBTQ2 community can face and why it's so important to be an ally and a supporter, which is what we're going to talk about next. Um, so before I dive in here, I just want to say that there's lots of very specific things to allyship kind of within the trans community, within the lesbian and gay community. So I really implore you to use the internet as a way to get some very specific resources, um, especially depending on if you, you know, if you have a relationship with a trans person in your life, whether they're in your family, whether they're a client, whether they're a friend or someone that you know. Uh, there are different ways to kind of interact well and be a support. And that's what really being an ally is. Being an ally is being a person that um, is willing to sort of do some of their own work, explore some of their own um, thoughts and behaviors and the glasses that they're wearing, the lens that they see the world through um, so that they can um, really be a support to these folks so that they can live really full, healthy, happy lives. 
Just gonna pause for one second. Am I still cutting out a little bit? I think the internet gets a little bit patchy sometimes. Okay, it's all right now. All right, check, check in with me again if it keeps cutting out. We're uh, right near the end anyways. So, in terms of how to be an ally, these are kind of very general umbrella ideas. Um, and then I've got some more resources at the end. So, first one, not making assumptions about gender or sexual orientation based on appearances. So, putting on that lens of when we're walking out in the world and we're seeing people dressed in certain ways or acting in certain ways, uh, what, are, you know, assumptions are we making about what kind of relationship that person's in or what, who they're sexually attracted to or even how they identify and how they feel comfortable in the world? Um, I know many women who identify as women, they identify as cis women, but they still may feel a level of um, discomfort or uncertainty with that identification, that identity. So uh, practicing kind of noticing and observing our assumptions is really important so that we can start to shift them. The other piece is really just trying to practice and it's less and over, less and over time is that people are just people. We want to respect them and their choices. And at the end of the day, with all of this, the biggest takeaway is that humans come in all different shapes and sizes. They come in all different chromosome balances, hormone balances, brain-based systems with different genitals, and who they're attracted to and how they want to be in relationship, who they love, how they want to be sexual. is all their own preference and their own experience. And if they're not harming other people, then it's healthy and it's okay and it's a big part of their healthy um, personal expression. The other piece is to really take it upon ourselves to learn more about the issues and people's experiences. So if we have, you know, a trans person or a lesbian or gay person or homosexual person in our life, it can be very fatiguing for them to be advocating constantly, to be trying to explain to us kind of the world through their lens or their experiences. And while it is important to know that every person's experience is very individual and depending on the kind of relationship you have with that person, you want to really build that trust to help understand in your eyelash, pardon me, allyship. It's also really important to just do the research to learn more of these things um, so that you're not kind of um, asking this person to get into advocacy fatigue, you know, where they're constantly trying to explain who they are to the world. <laughs> they just want to be who they are. And the more we take on uh, our own learning, the more we can just allow them to be who they are. One really concrete thing you can do is put rainbow and trans flags up in your office or building or on like your suitcase and your materials. And that's just kind of literally a flag to people to show uh, that you're an ally, that you are understand or wor are working to understand, that you're open, um, that you are a safe person to come talk to, which is really important. Respecting privacy is another one, and there's a lot of different nuances to this, which we can often not think about, and that's why it's really great to watch some of these videos online with the things like, you know, five things not to ask a trans person. Um, one of the basic rules is that we don't want to out people. So people's identity is their identity, and it's their identity to share, and because it can be really safe, sorry, unsafe, pardon me, to share, um, it's up to them to decide when they want to share it. So if they share it with you, that's great, and you're allowed to know that, but it's not our role to then go around and tell other people how somebody is identifying. So if we find out that a colleague is gay or lesbian, it's not really our job to go tell everybody else <laughs> that they're gay or lesbian. Um, it's just our job to let them know that they, they have our support within the workplace. Um, the other piece there is also, and this is more specific to trans issues, um, because we tend to be very kind of confused about trans issues and we have a lot of questions, we can ask people some very invasive things, in particular about genitals, that we would never ask a cis person. So we don't really care where cis women go to the bathroom. We don't tend to ask people what kind of surgery they've had done recently on their genitals. Um, we don't tend to ask a lot of invasive questions about people's bodies, uh, unless we're in a medical situation. And so we shouldn't do the same to our trans folks, no matter how curious we are. It's very disrespectful. The last pieces here that I want to look at is specifically in relationship to um, our jobs as frontline staff working with folks with intellectual disabilities. 
And it's really important to know that I'm obviously and very certainly coming from a very perspective, um, certain perspective um, and values based around this conversation. And that we have many different um, cultural and religious perspectives on these topics. And when we're working in a caring profession, it's important to remember our motivations for being there and our grounding for being there, which is often that we're, you know, we're really trying to support folks to just live their fullest life. And that means they need to live their life, not our life. And so we have to be really cognizant of what our values are around sexuality and sexual orientation, sexual identity. We have to be careful that our values are our values and they're not necessarily our clients' values. And it isn't our job to teach our clients what to believe about these things. It's our job to support our clients to understand them and come to their own understanding, their own values around it. And that can be really challenging. I don't want to acknowledge that it's not always easy. And what I say in terms of the allyship is just to really recognize and be grounded in your values and know your limits in terms of um, your support, your ability to support and be an ally. And if somebody does you know, talk to you about that crush that they have on somebody or that sexual fantasy they had or if they're displaying behavior that you're curious about, uh, supporting them to talk with someone else who may be more of a resource for them is a really great option. And that's why the second piece here is just responding positively to questions, inquiries, and referring people to other support. So we don't necessarily need to be the ones to... Um, provide all the information and support people to go through stuff, but we do want to be a conduit to that information and to that support. And then the last two are really just about doing kind of our own internal work, right? So the way I like to think about this is that we all have sort of glasses that we view the world through, and our language is a really big part of shaping that. So that's um, thing <coughs> like... When we come into a room and we say, hey, girls, and hey, gals, uh, instead of just, hey, folks, because hey, folks would refer to anyone in the room, regardless of how they identify. Um, looking at assumptions we make, looking at the language we use, and how it kind of controls the way we view things is really important, and kind of questioning that heteronormative or cisnormative assumptions, right? So you know, is everyone in a monogamous relationship? Do they need to be? What are our values around what is okay and what's not okay? And that's just kind of constant work and constantly being part of an ongoing dialogue about these issues. Um, any questions? I think I see one coming up. Just one minute. Are you still hearing me okay? Right. Oh, did I just, um, did the audio cut out for a minute, but it's back in? Okay. Yeah, it's good old internet. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, all right, well, we're just on our last two slides here. I'm going to share the um, video up in the next week or so as well, and you can always email me if you have further questions. Uh, so to learn more, I mean, you can copy these down, take a screenshot, or they will be in the video. Uh, these are just kind of some YouTube resources that you can check out about um, being intersex, gender, how it's learned, and being an ally. And then uh, this is just a set of resources, mostly Yukon-based. So in the Yukon, we have QueerYukon.com, uh, or Queer Yukon, sorry, which is the organization that kind of supports LGBTQ. Uh, we also have All Genders Yukon, which is the trans advocacy organization and support group. 1-800-SEX-SENSE is actually a BC-based phone call line operated by Options for Sexual Health, and they're open, uh, I believe it's 7 to 7 or 9 to 9, uh, and they've got uh, sexuality um, counselors and nurses and sex therapists all kind of available to chat with about all this different kind of stuff. Q-Munity is also a BC-based organization with many different resources. And then we've got a few other phone numbers here. You can always call me uh, at the Yukon Association for Community Living and, of course, the Yukon Sexual Health Clinic. There's a wide variety of resources out there. 
Um, Q and A. Uh, does anybody have any questions about stuff they've seen there or specific scenarios? I'm happy to kind of get on chat in just a minute. I'm just going to put up my contact and info here and resources. And I just want to say our in closing, our next webinar is May 6th, and it's about friendship and supporting our clients and family members to build friendship, as well as the importance of friendship. Um, we have two uh, online workshops left, so that one and then the last one, which I can't remember what it's about, so we'll find out <laughs> uh, in June. And in the meantime, you can always call me, you can always email me at whycommunityliving.com you have any questions, you want to talk about specific scenarios and situations, or you're looking for additional resources. So, thanks everybody, and have a lovely evening. I'm just going to turn off the video here. One second.